Good morning. Welcome to Wednesday in the Word. I'm Reverend Dusty Luthie, the pastor here at First Cumberland Presbyterian Church, and you are welcome however you found us today. This is the space where we dive into the Word of God and we connect Sunday to Sunday to make sure that um, God doesn't just receive an hour of our time once a week, but that we are faithfully considering um, the messages that we hear in the congregational setting on Sunday and applying it to our lives through scripture reading, through prayer, through discernment, through our community of faith and our time together in fellowship. Today I want to continue talking a little bit about some of the ideas that we discussed on Sunday. If you were here in person, you know that we are still in the middle of our sermon series called How to Be the Church 101, Getting Back to the Basics starting with some of those um, early church principles and concepts and seeing how they still apply to our lives as believers in Jesus. And we talked on Sunday, this Sunday's theme was the church forgives. And we talked about at times how that can be easy or possible, but also how difficult that can be, especially if we have truly been wounded, especially physically, when someone goes through a physical trauma or a truly horrific um, tragedy of mental wounding, emotional wounding, more so than just hurting feelings in a conversation or an interaction, right? It can be so hard and, and truly impossible to forgive someone. But then we are reminded that we are, we are told to forgive as Christ first forgave us, as God first forgave us. And it all happens through um, the person, the deity found in Christ, and that our power is not found within ourselves. That at times we do not have the ability ourselves to do the forgiving, to issue the forgiveness. Or even maybe um, if we are the transgressor, right? We are so mired in our guilt and our shame. Sometimes it's hard to rise up out of that. But because we have been given the gift of the Holy Spirit, that um, once Jesus ascended to go back to God the Father, God the Creator, after that resurrection from the dead, the crucifixion, the resurrection, and then the ascension, Jesus promised to send a helper. And this is what we as Trinitarians consider the third person of God, the Holy Spirit. And so as the Holy Spirit resides in each of us who profess to be followers of Christ, we have the supernatural power. And it's only through that power, I believe, and I think scripture can attest to as well, that we have that power to forgive in situations in which it would be impossible for us to do otherwise. And so um, I've been reading to you and going through our Confession of Faith as Cumberland Presbyterians. Again, this is our doctrine. These are our statement of beliefs. Um, and it's, again, beautifully written. I have loved going through this. I um, Maybe God didn't intend this for you, but maybe God intended it for me. I think that's um, sometimes a part of my preaching and studying is that uh, all of these things first apply to me. And then if somebody else is blessed, so be it. But as I was studying forgiveness and going through the confession to see what the confession has to say about forgiveness, I was struck that the word forgiveness is not actually used that often in our confession, which was a little strange to me. Now, of course, there are many mentions of sin, regeneration, salvation, saving faith, um, all of the words that you would think. So it's a little bit of a syntax issue. So um, different words mean different things. And that makes the writing of it very beautiful for me. But one thing that I was struck by as I was looking for terms of forgiveness, it's less about the act of forgiving something, right? But because we worship a God who is so much more than a single act or a single decision, there's more. And that's what Jesus came to do. And so this is what I have really been wrestling with the past week as I have been going through our confession of faith and considering scripture, considering what Jesus has done for us as a world, um, our need for Jesus. And the word that I've really been um, wrestling with has been the word reconciliation. Reconciliation. And in some form or fashion, um, our confession, which is only seven sections long, it's not a very long, most of this book is actually constitution, directory of worship, um, rules of discipline, other things other than doctrine. Uh, the confession uses the root word reconcile 
almost more than it uses the word forgive. And so I was a little perplexed by this because we as Christians spend so much time talking about sins and being forgiven of our sins. But then what? Right? Then what? And this is where I think we as Christians need to take the next step as we love and uh, disciple and witness to others is forgiveness is essential, essential for um, our salvation. But the next step is where the beauty of God's grace is also found and where it's so important in this reconciliation. And so I'm going to read from Colossians today. Um, it is one of the suggested scriptures a lot of times when our doctrine talks about reconciliation. It's in the footnotes. Again, all of our doctrine is based on scripture and the way we interpret scripture. So nobody's pulling this out of thin air, which again, I think is so helpful that we have these footnotes. But I wanted to read to you from um, Colossians, which is another letter written by Paul to the church in Colossus, um, or Colossae, sorry. And so in chapter one, it talks about the preeminence of Christ. And it talks about how Jesus was with God at the very beginning of time, how Jesus has been a part of this foundational principle of creation um, until until he comes as a human person and embodies everything that God is, but is also human. And in this divine mystery, of course, things happen. So chapter one, um, verses 19, and then I'm going to go ahead and read verse through verse 23. For in him, Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And so it talks twice about recon reconciliation, reconciling things to God through Jesus. So Jesus, um, we know, is our stand-in, that Jesus took the punishment that we deserve through grace. Jesus bore all of our sins. Jesus forgave our sins. Everything um, that is not reflective of the image of God is covered by the image of Jesus as Christians. And so when God looks at us, God sees the image of Jesus, sees us through that lens, and so we can approach God right? That's the whole premise of being reconciled to God, that God is so holy and so perfect that nothing that is holy and perfect can approach a holy God, right? There is this, this supernatural division. And so we as humans, we are flawed. We are finite. Um, I love that word finite. We have a beginning and we have an ending. God is infinite. God does not have a beginning and God does not have an ending, right? And so we are so such imperfect reflections of the image of God, though we are made in the image of God, that Jesus has to cover that. And so God can then look at us and we can approach God with this fullness of Christ covering us. And that's when we are presented as holy and blameless and above reproach because through the sacrifice of Jesus, we are given that protection. And in our confession... Um, 3.07, Christ the Savior, God's mighty act of reconciling love was accomplished in Jesus Christ, the divine Son who became flesh, to be the means by which the sins of the world are forgiven. So here we have forgiven, um, the term forgiveness. So Jesus has, has forgiven the sins. Jesus is the catalyst. Jesus is everything that makes this part of salvation possible. But I love this term, mighty act of reconciling love. Sometimes we just say the word love and we know it's all encompassing and all meaning. But I love this adjective to the word love. Reconciling love. Or 
If you want to see love as a verb, then it would be an adverb, reconciling love as, um, you know, an action. You have love as a noun and love as a verb. And really, as Christians, we should think of love as a verb because it requires doing. It's less about feeling and warm fuzzies. It's about doing. I love the concept of reconciling love because it's not just a feeling. Love does something. It brings us to God, that God loves us so much not only does God save us, but that God brings us to God's self. That is a miracle that we can't forget. And that is part of salvation that we can't shortchange. That God doesn't just love us to save us, but God loves us to save us and bring us to God. And so as we think of reconciliation, not just with God, but with one another, what does that mean? How do we bring people to us? How do we bring ourselves to other people? When is it okay? When is it too much? When um, do we really need to hold people accountable for their sins and their misdeeds, right? Especially when we think of these harder things to forgive, the things that society has deemed to be uh, those really heinous sins, murder, child abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, all of, all of the abuses, right, that we see a lot of times. How do we, um, how do we navigate that, right? And I, I don't have the answer. As your pastor, I don't have the answer to know um, how best to reconcile with what we have termed the worst of the worst, because we know that all of all of our sins keep us from God. The easy little ones, the hurt feelings, all the way to the big ones, right? Every single sin keeps us separated from God. But for us as humans, for some reason, we seem to have to um, to stage them, right? To give them a hierarchy, which sometimes is helpful and, and sometimes is not. So how does it look to reconcile ourselves to one another? And again, I think it points back to that power of the Holy Spirit that we have to listen, we have to discern, we have to know what is healthy, we have to know what we are capable of, and I think we also have to understand what God is capable of. That God is capable of all things, that God is capable of moving without us, despite us, in spite of us, and alongside us, and with us as we move. Uh, we Christians are really good at cancel culture, right? That is a term that's popping up in our media these days. Um, when someone does something that we don't like, that we believe is against society's morals, uh, we cancel them out, right? We, we, we take away their rights, their privileges, things that they have been privileged to receive, whether it's media or money or endorsements or something like that, right? And sometimes we as Christians get really mad, as we see some of our leaders be canceled out or something like that, but we invented that, right? Uh, there, there are times in scripture where we have uh, have admonishments to cancel somebody out. It's very Old Testament-y. Let's cancel them out. Let's kick them out. Let's throw them out. Let's have nothing to do with them, right? But there's something to be said about reconciling. And I find this in... 5.09, as we talk about the purpose of the church, what does the church do? <coughs> Excuse me. The church in the world, 5.09 in our confession of faith, the church in the world never exists for herself alone, but to glorify God and work for reconciliation through Christ. Christ claims the church and gives her the word and sacraments in order to bring God's grace and judgment to persons. The church in the world never exists for herself alone, but to work, glorify God and work for reconciliation through Christ. And I find that our job as the church is to provide a community in which reconciliation can happen. Reconciliation is part of what means being made right with God and with each other. To be reconciled. Um, how do you reconcile your books, right? You make sure they're right. Make sure everything um, not just agrees with one another, but works together properly. Is a reflection of the accuracy of the rightness of the correctness of the way they are. 
And I see so much that we don't have the power in ourselves as individuals. We talked about this on Sunday, that our power has to come from God. Our power has to come from the Holy Spirit because we are asked as Christians daily to do things we are not capable of doing ourselves. I don't have the power to forgive. I don't have the power to love my neighbor sometimes because I don't like all of my neighbors, right? I don't have the power to give self selflessly all the time, right? I know what my budget is and I know how much money is in my wallet. I know what I need to buy lunch, right? Um, I, I keep these things in my head. But as the body of Christ, as we share all things together, which is what we've been learning, the church gives, the church loves, the church shares, uh, the church forgives, we are a community of faith. And we have to remember that while our salvation may be individual and that we have a personal relationship with God, we are called into community. And it's not just the church here at First Cumberland. It's not just the churches here in Denton. It is the worldwide global church and that we call upon each other, that we draw upon our power, our strength, um, and even join together in our weakness and acknowledge our weakness and then acknowledge the one who has the power, right? We give all of our praise and honor and glory to God who has the power, who has worked through Jesus. And then through the Holy Spirit, we are allowed to work alongside God. And that's where reconciliation happens is when we are surrounded by witnesses, when we are surrounded by our brothers and sisters, when we are encouraged, when we are emboldened, not just in worship, not just on Sundays, not just on Wednesdays or whatever your Bible study is, right? Um, when we join together in a sandwich shop and we pray together, when we join together gardening, wherever we are, that's where reconciliation can happen. That's where we talk things out. That's where we learn we are more than what we are capable of because we are called and known by God who wants to work through Jesus, through the Holy Spirit to enable us to work for reconciliation with God and with each other. And so be encouraged, friends, that there is a step beyond forgiveness. And then it's called reconciliation. It's called restoring a relationship. And again, I don't know what it looks like. I don't have all the answers. I don't know when and where and how and why we should and shouldn't. But know that whatever it is, God is reconciling those things to God's self. And that we can trust that as God brings people along, brings situations along, begins to heal those situations, that we are taking part of that healing as well. It may not be done overnight. It may take 30 years, 40 years. It ta is taking a lifetime. It's taken many lifetimes, right? As, as Christ has ascended, we trust that Christ is coming back and God is busy reconciling all things to God through Jesus, through that enactment of the Holy Spirit. And so we know God is at work and that God is working all things together for the good of those who love God. And so trust today, friends, that you are currently being reconciled, that it's a continuation, that you are still in the presence of God, even on the hard days, even on days when things don't feel right, even on days when you have people who are estranged from you, when you don't know how to make things right, know that God first is making things right um, with God and that things, um, things are moving, things are working, even without us knowing. Let's pray. Oh God, we thank you for working beyond us, for working through us, for working alongside us. God, thank you for calling us to be a part of your ministry, a part of your reconciling love through Jesus. Help us to trust the Holy Spirit as it works to convict us, to mold us, to shape us, to be more Christ-like. Help us to carry all of these things in our heart, God, that we can be better representatives of you and your kingdom. Help us to forgive. Help us to love. Help us to seek reconciliation. Help us to make things right. Help us to restore relationships so that you can receive the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us. Coming up this Sunday, we are in person at 1424 Stewart Road, Denton, or you can find us live on Facebook. We are going to be talking about the church welcomes. How to be the church 101, the church welcomes. And I had thought this might be the last of the study, but I think maybe there's one more. Uh, we'll see what the Holy Spirit directs us to for the Sunday after that. 
Um, but I have really enjoyed diving into the word, diving into our confession and our beliefs and reminding ourselves what it means to be the church. So um, thanks for joining us on this journey. Have a great day. Talk to you later. Bye.